The weird debate about the internet, the fate of the internet, and Andrew Tate. So, Andrew Tate is a phenomenon. He first he rose to fame, just uh, basically rambling about things, and then he got cancelled, basically on all platforms at the same time. Somebody decided, well, we don't want to promote this anymore. And then he, he was basically kicked off of almost all platforms. So now the question arises, what is Andrew Tate? I think the phenomenon can be explained with one word. It's a German word and it is kind of the thing you do when you use a torch and then you direct the torch towards somebody's eye and the, the person cannot see anymore because the person is blinded by your light. Blinded by the light, as some famous musicians also already stated, is then called blinding somebody. And you could call the somebody who blinds somebody blinder. And if you then get the same word in German, it is called a blender. It is actually the same word that is actually a blender in English, but it of course doesn't have the same meaning. So now the question arises. Um, what is the difference between a blender and an imposter? So basically a blinder and an imposter. I think the difference is this. An imposter just is a fake it till you make it kind of thing, but the negative side of it, where he, the person hasn't really made it yet. An imposter is this kind of. Then we have the blender who is kind of a show off, you could say. But he is also not really a show-off, because a show-off is, at least I associate a show-off, much more with somebody who is kind of at school, for example, and tries to show off his latest Lego collection. So, therefore, I think it's a little bit different here. And the difference, I think, is that someone like Andrew Tate has a few things he actually wants to state or to say, and he also apparently is a kickbox champion, some kind of... And so he has a few things, actually, and he also has some money. Now, what now somebody who wants to blind people, who wants to blend people, compared to somebody who just is an imposter, I think, does is he just exaggerates all the things he has and says and maybe exaggerates things up to a point where you don't really know whether you can believe him. So there is also this thing with getting to know people. And as you get to know people, so this is kind of the equivalent in your social environment, maybe, as you get to know people, there are these people that just seem to be more and more and more interesting. And the question is if they really are more and more interesting, or if they just are slightly exaggerating all the time. They are kind of trying to impress you at any given moment and trying to give off the image that they are a little bit more intelligent, that they worked a little bit harder than the others. And these people, I, I just call Blender. There is also a book I read about um, kind of these people, and maybe I also am one of these people. Or I don't really know. I, I actually do know. I probably am one of these people. So now, or at least I have some tendencies that make me do things that... Uh, that make me seem maybe more intelligent, maybe less intelligent. I don't know. I, I do know I have these tendencies, I think. But now back to Andrew Tate. Now, we kind of do know what he is. I think that's kind of, of course, he is many things. And this is just a word I now took to describe him. And of course, maybe I will talk to him at any point in time in the future. Maybe I will not. I think the chances are pretty low that I will, therefore I am making also this video. And if you're making a video of somebody, about somebody, without having ever met them, then this is already kind of a weird thing. Of course, this person may have said some things. But now let's get into the second debate. Let's get into the debate of Andrew Tate. And also the internet, the fate of the internet, the internet of fate. Now. For quite some time, Andrew Tate was the most searched person on the planet, apparently. At least that's what other sources stated. I did never look it up on Google Trends. Now, here is the question. The question of what is acting. And I think there are three layers we can explore. The first layer is this one. If somebody is alone in his room and he does things that seem to an observer Maybe a camera is installed in the room and the person doesn't know about this camera. A security camera, for example. And this person acts abnormal. 
then we usually call this crazy. Of course, there are crazy, being crazy is also a, a medical condition and being crazy is kind of a umbrella term, an umbrella term for many different conditions, I guess. But what I'm trying to say is if there is a person that acts without social pressure in, so basically a person that thinks the person itself, it's, it is unobserved and he now acts crazy. This is layer one. So now we add a camera. The person acts crazy in front of a camera. Is this now something different? So the only thing that changes now compared to the first scenario where we have an observer that could be a camera is that the person knows about the camera. And now this might already change what the person does because there are things like social filters we all do and have. So basically what we think at any point in time is not the thing we act out, it's not the thing we state at any point in time. We constantly apply filters to what we say. Now some people apply more filters to what they are saying, politicians for example, because if you are James Gunn for example, who is not a politician, but who made some tweets in the past, and then he gets fired by Disney, and then he gets re-engaged by Disney, then tweeting out something that is a not, that is kind of less filtered, might be a potential risk, a potential career risk. And the same is true for everything you state and say online. So now, coming back to scenario one and scenario two, where the only difference is that the observed person knows about the observer, the camera. The question is now, what happens if, what is, what is actually acting? What is acting? And now here is the third thing. Now there's a person and there's a camera and there's also a person behind the camera. And this kind of thinking was actually inspired by a video I watched of fitness guru Connor Murphy who made a video about his grand plan. He basically tried to reenact Jesus, method acting Jesus, but I think it didn't really work because in the in the process he lost basically um, a large portion of his following because he just acted seemingly crazy, which was all part of his ingenious plan. And Maybe it just didn't work out that well, I think. Uh, nevertheless, he made all the these videos. What I'm trying to say is that he also discussed kind of the border between acting and not acting. And this is something I thought about quite some time already, some time ago, and also read books about. But the, the main thing is this. You act never the same. You always adapt to the circumstances. If you talk to your mom, if you talk to your grandmom, which is called your current mother. If you talk to your teacher, if you talk to your professor, if you talk to your boss, maybe, you will always adapt slightly differently. And even if you have certain roles you kind of come back to, every situation is different. In every si single situation, you are a slightly different person and therefore you will never really act the same. We can we can nevertheless categorize all of these different things and put them into different boxes, like your role as a son, your role as a father, your role as an employee, your role as a maybe boss. And these are different roles we have to play. And depending on the roles, we might take the same role exactly as we would take if we just were the other person, which is kind of a phenomenon I coined for myself with a name, I don't have a name right now, but I in the past thought about this and I came up with some some kind of name like the role switching phenomenon, which is basically the phenomenon that, for example, if you are at a party and you are the driver, then everybody kind of slightly makes fun of you because you are the driver and you cannot really drink alcohol. This happened to me a few times whenever I was at a party and I was the driver or I was not the driver. So when I was the driver, I was like, yeah, <laughs> you have fun with the alcohol and things like these. And when I was not the driver, I was basically making fun of the driver because he couldn't drink alcohol and he had to be funny without the alcohol. And basically I did the exact same thing in the opposite roles. Basically I played, I could have played both roles at the same time if there were two versions of me that were at the same time at the party. And now when it comes to acting, so there we have established that there is a degree, it's a spectrum of acting. Everybody acts all the time. Acting is basically the same 
as doing things. This is kind of the same word. And acting, of course, in front of a TV camera is also just doing things. The only difference is that we kind of think that we pretend. There are also people who think that they pretend in front of the camera, but what is actually happening is that the director has chosen specifically these people because the mannerisms of these people actually fit the character they should display. And so these people are not really acting. Think of somebody like The Rock who plays almost the same identical character in almost every single in every in almost every single movie. Or think about maybe Ryan Reynolds who also seems to be almost identical to Deadpool. And there are many comments on the internet that he is Deadpool in real life and this is so cool. But what is, of course, this is cool, partially, but in terms of his acting capabilities, if he plays the same role all the time, I mean, this is just typecasting. Now, this whole process is called typecasting. If you actually choose somebody that actually also embodies this kind of persona. You could also think of Robert Downey Jr. in real life and also as Iron Man, he kind of has a big overlap between these two personas, actually. And let's now come back to Andrew Tate. He stated in a few recent interviews that it was all just an act. It was all just acting. It was just a persona he displayed. And I think to some extent this is true. To some extent he just took things he said. I actually took a look at his channel at some point in time and I scrolled down and I saw videos where he just talked like almost normally, you could say. And also very uninterestingly about just random things that I was not interested in. And also when he talked, I, I think, I don't want to be um, now come off like a show off, but from the first time I saw this guy, I saw it, him actually on uh, Fitness Guru's channel, Mike Thurston, and he was on there. And then I saw a few different clips and then I saw mostly other people talking about him, like Colin and Samir, for example, and also other people. And what immediately kind of sprung to my mind is the word blender. Not really the word blender, but I just knew immediately this, that this guy was kind of trying to exaggerate things. He was kind of, if I had a bullshit, um, a bullshit thing, then it kind of would have showed me that this is bullshit, what he's trying to do. So now he was kind of acting. This whole thing was kind of acting. The same is true for me. I am currently now acting in front of a camera because there, are, there, is, there is actually no one in the room I talk to. I talk to myself. I take a look at myself on the screen and I talk to this person on the screen, which is me, which is also kind of mirrored me. And it's weird. But now here's the thing. As a society now, what happens if people like, let's take the, the worst example that is usually taken of history. What if Adolf Hitler came out when actually the Allied forces kind of surrounded Berlin already and he just came out and said, oh, it was all an act. Then the question arises, to which extent can people use the acting excuse in order to excuse actually real life acting? What is the difference between real life acting and actually just acting? It is the intent of the person, but we often don't really know the intent of the person. A person can be clinic clinically crazy or clinically insane and have actually has, or a person can have actually a psychosis, but it also can just be that this person actually has intentions to be maleficent or to be malef to be evil, let's say, just say. Let's say a person wants to be a bad person. Actually, I don't really think that many persons want to be bad persons. There are just mechanisms in the brain that drive them towards seeking out behavior that we socially condemn as bad because it doesn't serve society, for example. So now, if Adolf Hitler came out of the bunker in Berlin, I think it actually was not, I'm not entirely sure, entirely sure where he was at the end of the war. Now, the thing is, if he came out and said it was all an act, nobody would have treated him any differently, I guess. Maybe. I mean, what would have happened if Hitler actually was declared clinically insane? Would there have been, what, what would have been the difference, I think? That is kind of the thing. Also, there is, of course, a spectrum of people being 
I mean, I'm not an expert on this topic and I'm also not a psychologist, nor am I a psychiatrist, nor am I a medical doctor. But people are not just either one insane or zero not insane. People are not just normal or insane or crazy. But some people are actually on the edge. And actually all people are on the edge. The thing is just where do we find the edge? So basically we say just at a certain point of the spectrum that a person now is crazy. And the same is true I think for acting. We just say at a certain point that the person is now acting and I don't other times we say the person is not acting. If you, for example, take a job interview at a company you would like to get a job, then you could choose to act or you could choose to more... Acting, of course, is only kind of trying to perform better, trying to do the thing that the other people expect you to do. And what I'm trying to say is, if he now comes out, if Andrew Tate now comes out and says, it was all acting. It was all a persona. It was all like 80% of it was just trolling and 20% of it was just actual normal stuff. Truisms, you could say. Like, don't do stupid things. That's a truism. It actually works because stupid things are defined already as stupid. And if we then say, don't do stupid things, that then that sounds very logical. And it sounds like this is something that actually is worth listening to. And if you now make these truisms a little more complex, like... Um, don't be lazy, like uh, do the thing you love. Of, co of course, you could also do the thing you hate. That's not actually, that's more complicated truisms, I think. But the obvious ones are don't do things that affect you in a negative way. Things like these. I actually maybe should make a list at a point in time and then just have these very available whenever I record things. The question now. The final question is, to which extent do we want to excuse acting as an excuse as a society? And do we now want to say that Andrew Tate, who said things which could have... I mean, whether a platform kicks off somebody is not my decision. It's also not really the decision of a country or of law. Of course, it is kind of a decision from law if the law requires it, but in this case, it didn't probably require it. So therefore, it is the decision of a company. And if it is not a platform that is hosted by the state, for example, or by governments, then the society doesn't really have a lot of influence on this decision. And the question, therefore, is up to the company, to the company that then decides whether Andrew Tate was just acting and therefore has an excuse or if he actually meant the things. But of course, nobody will ever know until we actually figure out how to scan our brains and then actually realize and predict whether a person was actually just acting.